In this quick start tutorial for V-Ray Next for SketchUp, we'll cover the basics of using the improved material library to create, edit, and apply various realistic materials, as well as how to edit preset materials and create new materials from scratch. For this tutorial, I'm using SketchUp Pro 2019 and working with a file called 04 Material Start, which you'll find in the Assets folder for the tutorial files provided in the link in the description. You can also feel free to use earlier versions of SketchUp as well, since V-Ray Next works with version 2016 onwards. To begin, let's open up the Asset Editor, and in the Render Settings, make sure we're on the GPU Render Engine, and that the Interactive Mode is switched on. In this case, you can also feel free to use the CPU as well, as the results should not be noticeably different for this project. Now, let's start an Interactive Render to see what we have here in our project. Currently. We have a simple interior room setting with a default generic gray material applied to all of the geometry, as well as a couple of scenes prepared for working with different types of materials. Now, in the V-Ray Frame Buffer, or VFB, let's draw a render region around the table set. This way, we can get a faster preview of it as we start to work on our materials. To begin, I'm going to select the Coffee Mugs component and then click on the Materials tab. Let's expand the Materials Library by clicking on the left-hand flyout menu, which we can use to quickly add materials to our image. First, select the Materials folder, expand its drop-down arrow to display material categories, and then select the Ceramic and Porcelain category. I'm going to choose the Porcelain A01 white material, and right-click and choose Apply to Selection. You'll see in our preview that the material immediately appears on the selected coffee mugs objects, and is also added to our materials list as well. Now. Let's close the flyout menu and double click to open the mugs component. Then, select the coffee mug on the right to create a separate porcelain material for it. To do so, select the porcelain material and right click to duplicate it. Then, let's right click and apply the duplicate material to the mug we selected. Since the material is just a duplicate, we won't see any difference in the VFB at first. However, I'm going to expand the right hand flyout menu and click on the Diffuse Color Swatch to change its color to a dark grayish blue. And we'll see it update right away in the interactive preview. Now, let's right click and rename it to add blue material after Porcelain A01. Okay, now that we've set the colors for the mugs, let's right click in the viewport anywhere and choose Close Component. Next, expand the material library once more, and in the Car Paint category, let's drag the simple black simple dahlia yellow, and simple white car paint materials to the asset list so we can experiment with them. An important tip here is that car paint materials are not restricted to use with cars and the automotive industries only, but they can also be very useful for creating coated glossy paints. To demonstrate, let's select the table legs component and apply the black car paint material to them. Next, select the upper tips of the legs, as well as the tabletop base, and apply the Dahlia yellow car paint. It looks nice, but let's drop down the V-Ray BRDF rollout, and then change the diffuse color to blood orange. Now I'm liking how that looks. Next, double click the front chair component, then let's select its base, and once again, apply the Dahlia yellow material to it. Since the chair on the left is a copy of the chair component, their materials are linked, and the material appears on both of them. Now, following this exact same workflow, I'm going to continue applying some materials from the library to the chairs. To move things along, I'm going to speed up the video here a bit, but you can feel free to copy my material choices or experiment with your own selections from the material library. While having a look at the floor here, let's select the rug component, which contains fur. Back over in the Create category, Let's drag and drop a hair material into the asset list and apply it to the rug. Then, I'm going to adjust the diffuse to an off-white color and leave the other parameters unchanged. The hair material is perfect for semi-translucent, thin hair-like geometry, such as what we would find on a rug. Once again, I'm going to speed things up a bit here while we add some materials to the tabletop and bookcases. Note that the right and left bookcases are instanced copies, so materials applied to one will appear on the other, 
whereas the center bookcase is separate. All right, next, let's discuss changing the sizes of materials. In the material library, head to the paper category and drag the paper C04 material into the assets list. Let's apply it to the notebook cover. Since the notebook has a clearly identifiable texture pattern, we can tweak the texture size to make it feel more appropriate. You'll notice in the suffix of the material name that there is a size specified, in this case 8 centimeters. If we type 8 centimeters in the SketchUp default trays material dialog here, we'll render the appropriate size for this material's texture. That looks much better. Now, let's go forward and apply some materials to the laptop and then our standing lamp nearby. Okay, now that we've applied materials to the rest of our table and lamp, let's focus on the lampshade component. I'll select it, turn off the render region, and let's switch to the render camera lamp scene. Here, let's head to the Create category and drag and drop a metallic material, which is designed to work with a metalness PBR workflow commonly found in software such as Substance Designer. This material is a brand new addition in Vray Next for SketchUp, and is typically used in conjunction with texture maps from other software, enabling you to create much more complex metallic shaders, such as corroded copper, with less maps. Let's draw a render region around the lampshade and apply the metallic material to it. Then, expand the material parameters, and in the diffuse texture slot, let's add a bitmap. I'm going to then load in the paint rusty diffuse bitmap, which you'll find in the assets folder for this lesson. Then, let's click the up arrow to go back up in the hierarchy to the material, and in the metalness texture slot, let's load in a bitmap called Paint Rusty Metallic. Now, it's important that we then set the color space to rendering space linear, as this will prevent any gamma correction from being applied to the texture file before shading, which will make the result more accurate. Typically, you'll always want to switch the color space to rendering space linear for your metalness, roughness, and normal maps to get the best results. Back up a level again, Click on the Roughness texture slot, and let's load in a bitmap file called Paint Rusty Roughness. And make sure to set the color space to linear again. Now, back up a level, let's toggle on the bump in normal mapping, and drop down the rollout. Switch the mode to normal map, and let's load in the bitmap called Paint Rusty Normal, and set the color space to linear. Back up in the parameters, let's then lower the bump to 0 0.01 to soften the bumpiness a bit. Okay, now let's explore how we can do some additional more advanced tweaks to our material. At the moment, you can see that our material looks fairly metallic, but to improve it, we need to remove the gray values in our metalness texture map. This is because the metalness texture map acts like a mask between metal and non-metal areas of the material, represented by white and black values as interpreted by the metalness parameter. Gray values are somewhere in between a metal and non-metal state and such values do not correspond to any physical material. As a result, to remove any gray values, we can put our metalness texture inside a spline curve and use that to tweak the map. Let's right-click on the metalness texture slot, and in the Wrap-In menu, select the Spline Curve option. The Wrap-In menu creates a new texture in the texture slot, in this case the spline curve, while placing the original texture, our metalness texture map, within the spline curve. This makes it easy to plug one texture into another allowing us to make color corrections to our metalness bitmap in the Asset Editor with the new Curve options in V-Ray Next. For example, let's switch the Spline Curve to Value Mode and set the Interpolation to None, which modifies the curve's shape between control points. Then, we can click here in this graph to create a control point, and we can drag it up to create a vertical line and tweak the map's values, making the gray spots lighter or darker depending on the position of the line. You can think of this line as a threshold, Position to the left, more shades of gray are interpreted as white, making the overall scuff marks appear metallic. Moving to the right, more shades of gray are interpreted as black, making those spots non-metallic. Let's leave it to the right to make the gray values black. These will now appear in the render as non-metallic scuff marks on our lampshade, similar to corrosion, which is what we want. Okay, back up a level, 
Let's now zoom in on the lampshade a bit and explore some very useful UV mapping features. Here, we can see that we have a lot of seams that appear on the texture in the viewport. We can easily fix this using the different types of projection modes, which are now presented in the V-Ray Utilities toolbar, such as Triplanar and Spherical Projection options. Let's click on the Triplanar Fit option, and you'll see that the UVs update immediately and the seams have all disappeared. Depending on the object and UVs you're working with, you can experiment by clicking on the different options to see what works best for any given scenario. Okay, let's close the lamp component now and go back to the Render Camera 02 scene to create our wall material. I'm going to expand the Material Library and in the Bricks category, drag and drop the Bricks Painted B03 material into our Assets list. Then, select the wall component and apply the bricks to it. The first thing you'll see is that the size of the bricks is not right. To change this, once again go to the SketchUp default tray and in the Materials dialog, type 100 centimeters for the texture size as the brick material's name suggests. Note that using this size is not mandatory, so if we don't like how it looks, we can always experiment with the dimensions. I'm gonna bring it down to 80 centimeters and see if that fits better. That looks pretty good, but I'd also like to change the paint to fit our color scheme better. If we click on the Diffuse Texture slot, you'll see we have a mix operator for blending together two textures. If we click on the Texture A slot, we can change the bricks to an off-white color. Okay, that looks much better. Next, let's go to the Render Camera 01 scene to make the floor material and wrap up our materials exercise. In the Wooden Laminate category, Scroll down and drag the Wood Planks A02 material into the Assets list. Select the Floor component and apply the material. Then, let's change the size to 100 centimeters. Next, click on the little plus icon to add a reflection layer on top, since the floor is too much diffuse for my taste from this perspective, and I want it to look more like lacquered wood planks. Let's bring the reflection glossiness of the top reflection layer down a little bit to 0.95 to introduce some subtle blurriness. Then, in the bump rollout, let's bring the bump amount down to 0.01 in order for the reflections to pop out a bit more. Okay, lastly, let's finish with an entirely custom material for the floor, which we'll create from scratch. In the Create tab, let's drag a generic material into the Assets list and then apply it to the floor component. Next, in the Diffuse Texture slot, Let's load in a bitmap called Concrete B Diffuse. Let's also set the texture size to 100 centimeters. Then, copy the Concrete B Diffuse bitmap from the Diffuse Texture slot and paste it as a copy into the texture slot in the reflection parameter. This way, we can make a reflection map based on the Diffuse one. Now, right click on the texture slot and in the Rapid menu, select the color correction map so we can tweak the reflections. I'm going to bring the saturation down to negative one to make the bitmap grayscale, and then increase the brightness and contrast to make the material much more reflective. Back up in the material, let's now copy the reflection texture, then turn on the bump in normal mapping, and paste the texture as a copy into the bump map slot to give our floor a bit more texture. Let's also bring down the bump amount to 0 0.01. Once again, we can tweak the bump a bit as well using the color correction's brightness and contrast parameters. I'm gonna bring up the contrast a little bit. All right, I think we're now ready to do a production render. Let's stop the interactive render and in the VFB corrections control, load in the final color corrections file I have prepared in advance called 04 materials end, which is located in the asset folder for this tutorial. Then go to the settings tab, toggle off the interactive and progressive render modes so that we're rendering with buckets, and set the quality to high. Then, turn on denoising and make sure we're set to use the default V-Ray denoiser. Lastly, set the render output to the resolution of your choice. In this case, I'm going to render 1920 by 1920. And when you're ready, let's start our final production render. And once your render is complete, don't forget to save it to your hard drive by clicking on the disk icon at the top of the VFB. All right, 
Now you've seen how to use the V-Ray Material Library to make a variety of materials, as well as create and tweak new materials from scratch. In addition, you can modify textures with the new curve controls and other wrap-in options, as well as use the new metallic shader with PBR texture maps to create stunning realistic render results in V-Ray Next for SketchUp.